Go Bill. Um, thanks. Thanks for coming. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I had the pleasure of uh, featuring for Ed at uh, Crazy Wisdom uh, about a week ago, and that was uh, quite quite wonderful in uh, in Arbor. Um, I want to read some uh, poems from The Dig of Love. Um, <clears throat> this first one is called Rattlesnake Pancakes. I don't usually take bets, but I took this one. Gabo bet me a melamite ring. I wouldn't eat a rattlesnake pancake. Normally I'm cautious, but I needed a gift for Emily Beth, and her father, being a miner, had a thing for melamite. The thing on my plate was as dry as a dying scab, and it tasted as vile as it looked, but I got one swallow down, and then 20 followed in slow succession. I felt queasy, but Gabo never guessed. When five hours later, I was still alive, he handed over the ring. I ran to Emily Beth's mom's place on Arapaho. I found her sitting on a two-person glider on the wraparound porch. Emily Beth, I got a ring for you. Oh, blister, however did you afford a ring of melamite? That just heats my heart. Maybe so, Emily Beth, but are you tepid enough to wed? A gift is not a liberty blister. I'll not marry you until father life has sucked the selfish out your soul. Selfish, selfish. I ate snake poison for you. Yeah, but you didn't die, did you? So what's the good of that? Oh. <laughs> <clears throat> and this one is called <coughs> Tierra del Fuego. What I remember most was how dark it was at two in the morning and how angry the air was at two in the morning, and the sound of sobbing in the trees at two in the morning. My time there was not one evening, not one river, not one tunnel, not one falling. It was not one body, it was not one climate, not one lookout, it was not one of anything. My residence was a rain of observation, a slim shower of speculation, a felt resistance in the soil, a keen distance from the world, whose least reflex was a spongy corruption. When I landed, I was frightened but not unhappy. I was apprehensive but not unwilling. The land left me with the shadow of a longing, left me hanging by acuity. Then denial spoke and refusal erupted. The volatile earth got angry at depression's lack of shame and sore abandon became an argument. I didn't have the energy to win. And this one is called Crete. Nighttime, we trade untruths for bones. You lead me through a garden of planted ostentation. I look for stark cardinals, but you show me otters and possum. In the vinegar of darkness, we are made vivid. So those were some poems touching on love relationships, and I'll read a few uh, that touch on family relationships. Um, this is a poem about uh, a relative of <clears> mine. <throat> it's called Whorehouse, Anyone? I can't believe you said that to him, Unc. Really? In the limo? On the ride back from the cemetery? Yeah, you know, I thought he might be needy, having just lost his wife and all. So I said, Dad, I know this whorehouse on Vine Street. You want to stop by on the way home? I'll tell the driver. But he cut me off. No, son, that's OK. Let's just go home. So we went home, but at home, I wrote the address for him on a card and left it for him on his dresser, just in case maybe he felt like it later. Sweet babes there. Sadie, I had a fondness for in particular. And uh, I, have, uh, I have three children. Um, they're, all gro they're all grown now. Um, my daughter was born, uh, my daughter who is a therapist in uh, Cambridge uh, with a little uh, boy of her own now, uh, was born uh, very premature. She was born at 25 and a half weeks, uh, four months, about four months ago. Um, and she was born uh, very, very tiny, of course. Um, and uh, we didn't even make it to the hospital. She was born in the back of the car. Uh, my wife gave birth uh, in the back of the car as I was racing through red lights to get to the hospital. 
Anyway, so this is a poem that's related to that uh, experience. It's called A Debt No Honest Man Can Pay. I'm sitting here listening to Nebraska, and it's breaking my heart, not because it's plaintive and brilliant, but because it's taking me back to 1982 and our baby, not even two pounds in intensive care in a New York hospital, far away. We live in Queens. It's what we can afford. But we see her every day, well, one of us does, via the subway, where I sit listening to Nebraska. And Springsteen is singing about a debt no honest man can pay. And I'm thinking, what is that debt? It's marriage, right? It's love, right? It's the privilege of having a kid, right? Not in the song, but in life, in someone's life, in my life. It's a debt, a brutally honest debt, but you never pay it back, no one can, not with money, not with time, not with compassion, not with care, <laughs> not with what I make, not even with what you make. I'm not talking hospital bills. I'm talking what forever can never be repaid. So listen, you listen to a song whose line hits you in your kidney, and you double over as if you're pregnant, a pregnant woman, not close, not close enough to term, but you birth something anyway, and one day it becomes your heart. And then your heart gets pregnant, and it gives birth to your future, which you learn is made entirely of your past. A past where you're listening to a song, a concept, a whole album, again and again, over and over. The album, Nebraska, which never gets dull, never gets tired, never gets old. And uh, let me read one more family poem. Unless you think that my family is completely bizarre, um, this is uh, almost wholly imaginary, but it is a, a family poem. And its title comes from the book of Job, and a number of lines in it also come from the book of Job, and it's called Blackish by Reason of the Ice. I was in the basement. I was in the basement with Sarah, who was reading Job to the baby. I was standing in the basement thinking about Uncle Conrad's terrible black tie. 100% polyester, which he wore to the funeral last Tuesday. I was in the basement with Sarah, whose eyes were eyes of flesh, whose eyes were like the eyelids of mourning, who had made a covenant with mine eyes. And I said to her, Sarah, do you take it with your eyes? And she said, what? And I said, do you take it with your eyes? And she said, stop being stupid, hold the baby. And I said, I had not been as infants which never saw light, and she said, sharpening her eyes upon me, take the fucking baby. <laughs> and I took the baby, and I rocked the baby, and the baby rocked me. And as I comforted my son, and as my son comforted me, I remember they called Edward Dahlberg the Job of American letters, because he suffered in his art. Many there are who labor like slaves and suffer neglect. Does that make them Jobs? Sarah, I called, do you take it with your eyes? She was lost, lost in the text, and heard me not. And then, for just a moment, I too felt lost, like a child, like someone who meets with darkness in the daytime and gropes in the midday as in the night. Of course, I knew we could not order our speech by reason of darkness alone, any more than Uncle Conrad could have worn a different tie to the wake. For life is wind, and death is astonishment. Sarah, I am for. Take the baby, for he hath made me weary. And Sarah took the baby with her eyes. So those are some family poems. And uh, let, me read, uh, let me read a couple poems that involve uh, uh, places, relationships with places. Um, this one is called Andalusia. Partners in Sunset. The owl and I in ballet. He the small flame in the wind, I the last tremor in space. Like a tongue deep in my ears, the snow came from Andalusia. I survive myself. I circle the summits of the depths I reach. Reflections of the hawk, faint mountain silhouette. In what heart's alchemy do I turn you golden? In what heaven are you sanctuary? I am the billow of a sail, bright shadow of the electrical storm. Beside me the swollen weather. I am the same surface as the sea gone to fight. The fossils abandon me to the lonely trees who try to be a geometry. 
an invitation to kinship, an invitation to the sacristy, its door of yellow dust. The barnacle announces the debacle. I am the overgrown garden, the broken roof of the abandoned chapel. It is no longer dawn in Granada. So I will grow fat and die. The hawk, my vizier, I, his song, partners in sunset, silent, sunset beings. We circle each other. I am my neighbor's journey of a thousand miles. The sun bakes me in a shell. The carts of Compostela carry me to caves embittered with moss. The owl circles my surrender. The sun demands a chrysalis. The blossoms, lacking mercy, gesture ineptly. To see me now is to see a curtain of the mind, a canvas of the body. <coughs> and illusion, like a seraph, stands tiptoe on its wings. The blood of hounded days decays, reduced to a paste of travesty and verdigree. Someone's a ballet surgeon. Someone is a hand dancer. Someone balances a bowl of sugar on her knees. The moon is a hawk with its beak in my eye. Scribes of fire, Velasquez beside me on the opposite side of the river. And the owl charges the sun. The activity is continuous. I am born in the instant of amethyst. A Bedouin holds a petal out to the owl. The hawk bristles, the sun is taken to its butterfly. Suddenly the snow comes from Andalusia. I lie down in amethyst. All my dreams show black silhouettes of ballerinas in tungsten and shade. Hawks are tracing their steps, a land unremorseful, a sea unprepossessing. There's no weather to speak of, except for the owls singing, 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 singing above their wings. <clears throat> so that is a place uh, of the imagination. Um, and this is a real place. Uh, I grew up in Philadelphia, and this, um, this uh, poem comes from uh, that area. It's called The Ogon's Branch. There are stories I will not tell, stories I shudder to remember. You'll forgive me for withholding them from you. You may, of course, not tell me everything about yourself either. A violation of intimacy? To me, it seems it's guarantee. What I mean is, we can tell each other anything, but we don't have to. A string is stronger for its knots. It's not that I prefer living in a house with a locked door. That's not what I mean. What I mean is, did I ever tell you about the Ogon's branch? I mean the Ogon's branch of the Philadelphia Library. It was on Ogon's Avenue between Old York Road and Limekiln Pike. Thirty years ago, it was old and run down. It wasn't close to where I lived, but I used to love to go there afternoons after school. I'd drive over, hang out, read the paperbacks. No one there knew me. I made friends with a librarian a young woman from Conshohocken with an odd, cocky smile. Part of her job was shooing out the boozy bums. It was in the Ogots Library where I discovered Intimacy by Jean-Paul Sartre, a book of five longish tales, the only stories Sartre ever wrote. With eyes blazing, I devoured them. I ate without tasting, speeding through them like a starving man before a meat buffet. But back then, I read many books I said I loved, but didn't understand. Back then, that was perhaps the point, to race through the pages, to engulf, to possess the book. That, I felt, was the true thing. It would be decades before I understood what I had missed. If I am a book, I am intimacy. Read me. Wrinkle my pages. I'm not asking for understanding. If you want to check me out, Ask the head librarian of the Ogons branch. <laughs> um, and uh, let me read a couple poems about people that I know. Um, I grew up, in, I was born in Philadelphia and went to school there. But um, my summer were spent in Ocean City, Maryland, where my father ran a penny arcade on the boardwalk. Um, and so this is a poem called <coughs> Beetle Tales. When I was a kid, nicknames were all the rage. Down the shore, my friends were three brothers, Mutter, Tato, and Beetle. Mutter was my age, Tato was in first grade, and Beetle, after Beetle Bailey, 
was seven years my senior. Vito had this great idea. Fill my pockets with rocks and have me go over to the guess your weight guy. The guy would guess wrong and we'd win the plush skunk. A surefire plan. As predicted, the guy guesses wrong, eyes me suspiciously, snarls, glares, but hands over the toy. You don't look like you weigh that much. Well, I do, I shout. We grab the baby skunk and scamper into the beachcomber night. Beetle has me and Mutter lie down on their second story front porch and shoot peas at the plate glass of the Acme Market. People run from the store, pointing to balconies up and down the block, go back in the store, and come running out at the next volley. Hunker down under a nubby summer rug. We are invisible terrorists no one discovers. Beetle wants me and Mutter to shill for him. He runs one of the chance games on the boardwalk. You throw four balls into a box. The balls bounce and land in numbered pens. His back to the customers, Beetle pulls out the balls, counting impossibly fast. You win if the number is over nine or under 16. Amazingly, it never is. A guy in a felt hat takes a swing at him. Beetle is pimpled, thin, and very tall. He wants to go out with Kay, our 16-year-old babysitter. Kay blushes but refuses. Beetle keeps at her, then one day she says yes. The next morning, we wonder why Kay is crying and what those red marks are all over her neck. Chigger bite, she says. Mutter grows eight inches in one year. His parents fear he has cancer. Beetle works the sub shop near the pier. He treats Mutter like shit. One time Mutter sat on a bench in the sun for three hours waiting for his brother to get off work. I still dream about Mutter's sunburned shins. Beetle wears loafers with no socks. He wears a half button silk shirt. He brings a tall woman with teased pink hair into our place, Pennyland, and gives her five dollars in dimes to play pokerino. He introduces the woman to my mom. She's an exotic dancer, Esther. A stripper. My mom nods. Beetle wants to buy the arcade. My dad has cancer and needs to sell it. But sell what? Each summer we just rent the space. Well, there's the equipment. At least we own that. For 1900 bucks, Beetle takes 12 skee-ball lanes and a What's Your Future card machine. Um, and uh, I'm going to just, I have uh, two minutes left, so I'm going to finish with, uh, with, this, with this poem. Um, my uh, college roommate uh, and one of my closest friends died a couple years ago of pancreatic cancer. It was terrible, uh, sudden and just horrible. So this poem is called Bereft of Death. Had you survived, I never would have forgiven you for not telling me how sick you really were. But you died. So now what's the point of holding a grudge? Let it go. Last week, I visited a really swell West Coast house built on a hill overlooking the Pacific. I stood there and saw your reflection in the clouds, heard your voice in the industry of the lawn. I met your little boy six months after your funeral. He's a charmer, to be sure. So were you. May he outlive, even outdo his passionate dad. Maybe he'll be the future mayor of La Jolla, or be someone like you, who rose in the world on the strength of his sense, and like a telemon, upheld the refuge of those who had no other place to go. Jesus, I knew you when you were hale and stout like Cortez. Thank you.